Hi, it's Kernatex here and welcome to a new series on installing Linux from scratch 11.2. So this new version was released just a few hours ago and I'm going to take you through installing it. And what I plan to do is to show you how to install it on a machine that's currently got Windows 10 and how to replace Windows 10 with Linux from scratch. Word of warning. If you plan on putting Windows 10 back on, um, ensure that you have your product key um, and that the Windows 10 is activated correctly before you remove it. Um, I've just been having some problems in the last few weeks uh, with getting Windows activated. One machine, I didn't have the product key um, on a version of Windows I was trying to transfer, and another machine. The product key I thought I had didn't work and I had um, a number of problems trying to get both machines activated. So just be careful if you are using a machine that you want to keep Windows on ultimately to um, ensure, as I say, that it's activated correctly and you have the product key. Um, otherwise, uh, any machine that's available to you is good for installing um, sometimes people ask me about installing on a virtual machine there's nothing wrong with that i have done it once before but i had a few problems that i couldn't account for um, apart from the fact that i was installing it from scratch on a virtual machine so i do always recommend to um, install it on real hardware if you can uh, i know this is not always possible so virtual machines probably second best I, I do want to do another set of videos on installing on a virtual machine just to see how or if anything's improved. Um, but yeah, especially if it's first time um, building Linux from scratch, I do recommend actual hardware, building it on actual hardware if you've got a spare machine kicking around or even if you could uh, buy a second hand machine, they're quite cheap. Um, for example, the machine I bought, it's nearly 15 years old. Uh, the machine I've got here to build this on this time. Bought it uh, probably about mm, six, seven years ago. So it's about five, six, seven, eight years old when I bought it. And it only cost about £50 or so. Um, it's quite a decent spec machine. It's uh, an i5. It's one of the early i5s, uh, 3.2 gigahertz. Um, so it's... It's not the fastest machine, but it's reasonable for doing this type of thing. Um, uh, yeah, you're not going to get Linux from scratch completed in a few hours on it, but it certainly won't be days or weeks waiting for things to complete. So it's good reuse, and I suppose it's uh, doing something for the planet by reusing some old hardware. And indeed, Linux is such a scalable operating system. Um, that it is really good for repurposing old equipment, for um, making use of old equipment in a different uh, way or different environment. So this used to be my day-to-day -day machine and uh, I was running Gen 2 on it and it was just getting a bit too slow to keep things updated. For example, Chromium was taking, I think, nearly 24 hours to update on it and uh, it was becoming it was coming to the point where um, I'd finish one update and there'll be more updates to do and it seemed like it was nearly always updating. So I've decided to retire it and replace it with something a little bit newer. Um, as I say, it's nearly 15 years old, um, but it's it's fine for doing other things on it. It would make an ideal server, um, you know, for example, a web server. Um, but yeah, for now, I'm gonna use it to demonstrate Linux from scratch. So, um, yeah, there's the page with the announcement of the new version. And you can see that the whole tool chain has been updated. We've got a new version of Binutils, a new version of GCC, and a new version of GLibc. And also the Linux kernel is the latest version at the time of publishing. And Linux from scratch does now use the latest stable versions of all the packages. It used to be the case years ago that they'd stick with a particular version for a while and then update it every now and then, but they do 
tend to use the latest version. So you could say that Linux and Scratch is a cutting edge um, distribution, Linux distribution, in that the packages are uh, nearly. I, I can't say for certain that they're always up to date, the latest pa uh, packages, but I'm certain that 99% of the time they are up to date. So if that's important to you, then you, you, you know that that's the case. Um, now it does say that additionally a Python module installation has been changed to use the wheel method. So I'm not sure what that is. I'm not really up with what Python's about and so on. Um, the only wheel thing I know is the um, facility for adding somebody to a wheel group to allow them to escalate their privileges. So I don't know whether it's anything to do with that or it's something completely separate, but maybe we will we'll see that when we come to install that package. As usual, changes have been made to the text throughout the book, so I hope they've fixed some you know, spelling mistakes, grammatical errors and so on, or the way things are worded to make them clearer. Um, and as it says, you can read the book online or download it to read it locally. So what I'll probably do is to use the online version. I may actually download a copy as well in case I have internet problems, which does occasionally occur. Um, yeah, there's also a system D version, which again, you can read online or download to read locally. Now, uh, people sometimes ask me about doing a system D. I have done it once. Um, and also UEFI installation. Again, I've, I've done that once, maybe twice. Uh, what I tend to do is just install the basic Linux from scratch, which is a BIOS based installation. So a system V based installation. Um, and again, the, the PC I've got here is um, that old that it hasn't got UEFI on it, so it has to be a BIOS or System V boot. Um, yeah, a, a BIOS boot and a System V uh, startup um, for the Linux. Um, I could probably do System D on it, but as I say, I, I tend to do the basic um, LFS installation, which is still the non UEFI. Um, system V installation. Um, I don't know whether they're ever, ever going to change that or not. Um, maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure because on the one hand, using the BIOS boot method, i.e. the non-UEFI method, and using the System V method, there are fewer packages to install. It's a more basic installation. Um, if you go via the uh, System D installation, um, there are one or two more packages and certainly with UEFI there's about two or three other packages that need to be installed so the basic installation which I will show you is the faster and more basic installation and probably more generic as well if I was to show you the UEFI and the system D installation then it might prevent um, if you're following those instructions it might prevent you from installing on a, an older machine so by by showing you the uh, non UFI system, uh, the non system D, i.e., the sysv init method, then it's almost certainly guaranteed to work on um, old, well, it will work on older machines, but it's certainly almost guaranteed to work on new machines as well. Um, one thing I have to mention is that in the BIOS of the machine you're installing on, if it is a new one uh, with the secure um, boot that you need to either disable that or set the um, setting to compatibility uh, because the Linux from scratch installation won't be a secure boot it will be um, you know, traditional BIOS boot so you will need to make some changes there's information on the web about doing that um, but again if you're using an old machine so, you know, as I am then you don't need to worry about that it will be just straight, fairly straightforward so um, as you can see, I'm on uh, Windows at the moment and I'm going to be replacing, as I say, this Windows installation. If I just go to um, computer management, I think. Yeah, if I go to disk management, you can see what I've got on the disk. It's one disk. Uh, let's just make this a bit bigger. And you can see there's the Windows installation, there's the system partition, 
or system reserve partition rather. There's my C drive. And there's another partition there, which may be a recovery partition, possibly. I'm not sure what these partitions do, what they are. Um, but yeah, uh, you can see they're two tiny little partitions, those other ones, but the main bulk of the disk space is taken up with the C drive. So we're going to be deleting this, wiping it completely. Um, and installing Linux from scratch on this drive. Um, if you're interested in putting Linux from scratch side by side, again, one of my previous videos I've done, um, probably about a year or two ago, uh, shows how to install. Um, I can't remember if it's Gen 2 or Linux from scratch now, but it shows how to resize the, part, the Windows partitions and install Linux um, side by side with Windows and how to deal with how to boot, um, managing the boot process to decide which one you want to boot at, at power up. So you could use that as some hints, but as I say, in this case, I'm going to be completely replacing Windows. So I think the best thing to do now then is to shut this down and actually um, start the process of building Linux from scratch. Now, to build Linux from scratch, we're going to need to have a host version of Linux. Um, you can use probably any any version of Linux that already exists that's out there at the moment. Uh, but I recommend, uh, well, I used to recommend Gen 2, but then they stopped doing a live um, version of the Gen 2 system uh, around about 2016. And that started to get quite out of date, so I stopped using it. And I started using a um, distribution called Endeavor OS. Um, so if I go to that website, I'll show you it. It's this one here. And the reason why I chose this, because um, even though I've tried other uh, distributions, okay, looks like there's an issue there possibly. Um, even though I've tried other distributions, uh, I found that Endeavor OS had everything you needed as is with the live, um, the live distribution to install either Gen 2 or Linux from scratch, uh, which are both source, source based. So you need, um, uh, a compiler and, and all the support tools to, to use that compiler. So it made it much easier to build Linux from scratch or Gen 2. So that's why I started using this. Recently now, Gen 2 have started introducing, or have introduced a live USB image, which is updated weekly. So whereas I used to recommend Gen 2, then stopped, and I now, uh, or then recommended Endeavor OS, I'm now recommending Gen 2 again. However, I'd still recommend Endeavor OS if you, you prefer to try something different from uh, the live version of Gen 2. Uh, but my my preference over the two of them would be primarily Gen 2 because it is a source-based distribution. You can always guarantee that the tools are going to be there to compile uh, Linux from scratch or indeed Gen 2. Now, um, as I say, you, you probably could use Endeavor OS. I haven't tested the latest version which was released um, a few weeks ago. Uh, and I'm not sure what this transparency on the grub issue is. So whether that's if you install Endeavor OS on a hard disk, I don't know. So if you do choose to go down the Endeavor OS route, be aware there may be some issues. There may be, I don't know what this grub issue is. Um, and also there may be an issue with, um, are the packages required to do compiling still on, in the uh, live Endeavor OS distribution. The reason why I say that is another thing I liked about the Endeavor OS release, the live live release, was that it always fits, um, or it all, it's always less than two gigabytes. And that's really good for me because I've got this ancient USB stick, which is two gigabytes. So it meant that Endeavor OS, the latest version, would always fit on this uh, two gig USB stick. Um, yeah, which meant that I could still use this USB stick for boot, booting. You know, it still had a use. I didn't have to 
throw it away because two gigabyte is not not so big it's only a usb2 it's a little bit slow but um, it still is two gigabytes in size but i haven't checked to see if all of the uh, tools for compiling are on it so that's something to bear in mind if you do download it and try it uh, but yeah here's where you can download it these isos uh, there's torrent links there if you wish to use BitTorrent to download it. And then there's the uh, signature and checksum files for verifying that the download is correct. And it gives you details of how to check the download um, and so on. So that's the Endeavor OS. Like I say, I'm not going to boot from that this time. I'm going to use Gen 2. So if I go to the Gen 2 uh, web page... Just go to that. That's the landing page for the Gen 2 web page. To download it, just click up here. Oh, there's this Get Gen 2 web page. Now, this is, might be a bit daunting. There's loads of different things here. But by default, the, probably what most people are going to be using is the AMD 64. So this is a 64-bit Intel um, architecture. Um, and as you can see there, there's all this, also the uh, the also known as the aliases for AMD64. And this is the link that you want to click on here, the live GUI USB image. And you can see that's four gigabytes. It varies in size. It's been up to five gigabytes, um, over five gigabytes. So either they're compressing stuff better or, you know, they're putting think less stuff on there but i can guarantee because it's a gen 2 release it will have everything you need to do a compilation and you just click on this link and you can see it started downloading the iso straight away now i'm not going to show you how to create the iso within windows again that's something i've covered in uh, previous videos um, if you look for the one uh i think I think it's the, yeah, it probably is the one where I um, install uh, Linux. I can't remember if it's Linux from scratch or Gen 2 side by side. Uh, let's look for it and I'll show you which one it is. Uh, that's quite annoying. They keep showing my very first video that I did and it's well out of date. Uh, I wish they wouldn't do that, but never mind. Right, so if you go to playlist, it's probably the quickest thing. And look down here. Let's see if they're in date order. Yeah, they are. Yeah, I think it's this one. So yeah, it is building Linux from scratch 9.1 and boot, dual boot with Windows 10. So let's do a few full playlist. Yeah, it's probably this one, Preparing Host Linux. Uh, let's just turn the sound off there. Let's get the ads. Yeah, I think this is the one. Yeah, it shows you how to download a tool called Rufus. Now, the reason, one of the reasons why I'm not really going to show... Um, how to do this this time is because I don't use these tools that often. I'm not sure if it's the best tool. Um, you know, th this sort of thing I normally do in Linux to write a, a, an ISO image on a USB or on a CD. So I don't really want to recommend something or suggest using something that may be not so good in, in certain ways. Um, but if you do want some hints, there's certainly a video how to use it. At the time, I had used this uh, Rufus tool. Um, so... Uh, it was something that uh, was good for me. So, okay, some more adverts there. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to recommend anything, but if you do do a search, for example, um, write uh, ISO to USB Windows 10, for example, um, or indeed Windows 11, it shouldn't be any difference. There's something there that comes up. There's some videos there on how to do it. Um, some more suggestions here, two free ways to burn or copy ISO to USB. Um, may even want to 
be a bit more specific because the process for writing a Linux ISO is slightly different from writing a Windows 10 ISO. So let's put Linux in there. So yeah, there's that link coming up again. So that looks like that might be a possibility. There's no one there to create the Linux Mint. So it's another distribution. So that would be probably a good link to use as well. And there's a link for using Rufus, which is the tool that I used in my video. Um, see, this link wouldn't be any good because it's using the Linux DD. So you need Linux to, to actually use that command. So it's a chicken and egg situation. Um, so, yeah, and there's some more suggestions here on the right. So once you've got the USB, then you can carry on with what I'm going to do next because I've already prepared my USB sticks. Um, so what I should do next, I think, is I think I'll shut this down and I'll just put in, boot into Endeavor OS so you can see that in action. And then I'll... Um, boot into Gen 2 and start the installation process under Gen 2. So if I do a restart, and you'll have to forgive the screen will flick and might look a bit weird as the video signal uh, gets synchronized. Um, but let me plug in the, let's do a restart first actually, and I'll plug in the Endeavor OS flash USB I've got first of all, and I'll boot from that. Right, so this is the menu you get. This is um, a slightly different menu you'll get if you're booting UEFI, um, but that's the menu menu you get. You see there's several options there. Normally the first option is enough to get you booted up. Um, sometimes you will need to fall back. I can't remember if this machine does or not, but I have got one or two machines that don't play too well with the default boots on these live um, live machines. The Memtest 86, um, that can be useful if you're unsure about your memory. Uh, Memtest 86 is reasonably good at finding um, any problems with your memory. Um, I've, I've said before and I'll say again, the best thing to find memory errors is compiling and in specifically compiling the package GCC. It's the only thing that I've found has identified errors for me, memory errors in the past. Uh, where tools such as Memtest 86 and uh, I think it's Memtest, the other version, or other, yeah, the other version of Memtest um, have failed to identify memory errors. They've, um, you know, tested the memory and said, you know, everything's fine, but then I've had errors in GCC and they're the type of errors that point to um, hardware problems. So it is quite, if I run it, and you can see it started there. You just have to let it through uh, to run. It's printed up the uh, slots that are in use, the memory sticks, and it started running. As long as you get at least one pass, preferably several, um, you know, three or four maybe, then, you know, there's a reasonable chance that um, everything will be all right if you do want to test the machine. Be warned, depending on the amount of memory and the speed of the memory, it can take a number of hours. Uh, so that's one thing to bear in mind. You might want to run it overnight, possibly, depending on how fast it is. This looks like it's going to take uh, maybe half an hour or an hour or so. It does get a little bit slower the further it gets into the testing. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to do that now. I'm, I must admit, I haven't tested it for a while, but I'm reasonably confident. As I say, I was using it. Uh, this machine with Gen 2 on it, so it was compiling quite regularly and never had any problems. So I'll just escape that, let it reboot back into Endeavor OS. So there's a the menu, it'll, it'll time out, we can press enter and just wait for it to boot into Endeavor OS.
right, this is the point. If the graphics aren't going to work, then it would fail at this point. You can see it's cleared the screen, so this is where it would be. Uh, booting into the graphics. Now it is a bit of a slow USB. Yeah, I've got a cursor, so that's okay. So I'll just wait for this to complete loading. You'll know when it's finished because it comes up with a little menu with some options of what you want to do next. And that's the menu there. Um, so yeah, that's basically Endeavor OS. You can see they named it after the recent, um, well, the current NASA moon mission uh, called Artemis, um, which I think is going to they're going to reattempt to launch that this weekend. Uh, generally, to get going with this, I just close that down uh, if I use the right mouse. Uh, close that down, and you can click on. This link here to get the browser up. Uh, bear in mind it is a little bit slow because it's an old USB drive and it's USB 2 as well, so it's a little bit slow. And click this little black box here to get a terminal up. So I can make this a little bit bigger, I think, with yeah, that. Stretch that up there to get a few more lines, and yeah, it should be a case of just typing Linux from scratch. And it looks like the network works straight away as well, so that's good. And I'm in there, I think while I'm here, um, may as well just check to see if um, this. Uh, is capable still of building. Let's just quickly jump to this. I'll explain all this when we boot into Gen 2. I'll go through it a bit at a time, but basically this script here checks to see that all the relevant software is installed. And it does seem to be the case, so that's good. It's still a two gig image with all the software required to build Linux from scratch or indeed possibly Gen 2, although I would definitely recommend using the Gen 2 live image if you're installing Gen 2. So yes, indeed, this is still a, a decent um, release to uh, install Linux from scratch from. It's got everything you need there. Um, all the versions correct and all the packages that are required to build Linux from scratch. So that's Endeavor OS. What I'm gonna do now is to boot up the Gen 2 live USB and show you how to start that one. So hopefully I've unplugged the USB at the right moment. Find out in a minute. Yeah, it does look like it's okay. This to boot. So with Gen 2, when you, when it boots, you get this. Um, simple menu coming up and you get 15 seconds to press a button basically and this is quite good if you are having problems there's several options here the function keys from f1 to f8 or 9 i can't remember now will give you various options you can add to the command line so the first option if you press tab it gives the list of kernels that you can boot so i haven't got a cursor here, so i'll use my cursor that i'm using to record with so the default boot is Gen 2. Um, if you get problems with the video not working properly, then you can use the Gen 2-no FB, no frame buffer option. Uh, again, there's a mem test option, so I'll boot with that so you can show it in action. All you do is type the name of the kernel that you want to boot or the program, and you can see it's the same as before. It's um same screen. It's behaving exactly as it was before with the Endeavor OS version. So let's stop that and reboot into the Gen 2 version. So again, I'll just press a button, I'll press tab just to stop the countdown. Um, and yeah, so that's the mem test option. As I say, if you, if you try the Gen 2, the default, so if I pressed enter here, it would boot Gen 2. If you're having problems getting anything up on the screen or something not working like your mouse or your network, 
um, well, certainly if it's a video problem, try the Gen 2 no FB. But if we press F1, uh, well, again, it lists the kernels available, the same as what we've got here. Obviously, Memtest is not a kernel, it's a program, but it's able to boot from the boot line. Press F2, and this gives some information on other uh, pages that you can list. So it's up to F7 by the looks of it. And if I go through to F F3, you can see there's some options there to add in after the kernel. So for example, if you wanted to load APM driver support, what you do at the boot prompt is try type in Gen 2 or Gen 2 no FB space do APM and that will enable that option and you can add in other ones. So if you wanted to add in SCSI, you can just type keep on adding them and you can press uh, an F another F button to get it without losing what you've typed in. So you can see there's more um, options here. And quick descriptions. If you if you find descriptions not enough, you can go onto the Gen 2 website to find out more information about that or do a search in Google. Uh, that's F5. That's F6. You can see there's loads of options here for helping the boot work. F7. And yeah, there's no, nothing after F7. No, there's no F8 or F9. Uh, so, but generally, especially on more modern hardware, the defaults work. You don't need to put these other things in. One that I used to use in the past, which um, I haven't tried on this specific version of the USB, which is this week's version. They, I think they release a new version now every Monday. So it's a couple of days old, this version, two or three days old. Um, the previous versions of the uh, live boot disk that they used to release occasionally. Um, I used to use this NOX, so if I didn't want to bother with the GUI, wait for that to load up. I used to just type in NOX, um, and that would mean it would boot quicker. It would just boot into a text, a CLI, command line interface environment. Um, but when I tried this on a, uh, a version from about two or three months ago, so it's when they started doing these new live USB releases, it wasn't actually working. Um, so I don't know if that's something that's been disabled or something's broken, I'm not sure. Another one I used to use is keymap uh, equals UK uh, to set the UK keyboard, because there's nothing worse than having the keyboard default to the American and you press symbols like the at symbol or the uh, double quotes and you're getting up with other things coming up or the hash uh, is one that gets used quite often so by using that it meant that it would boot without having to it would boot and ask for the key map during the boot but you'd only get you know five or ten seconds to respond so if you happen to look away or you wandered off you missed that menu then you'd get the default of the us keyboard so by putting that key map option in um it would allow you to set the keyboard straight away. You could just let it boot right through. However, it's not really necessary now because the first thing that happens when you boot this new Gen 2 system is it presents the keyboard setting screen. It boots into KDE and it, it presents you with the menu for selecting the correct keyboard uh, within KDE. So it's not really needed anymore. So, yeah, so if I go back to the first uh, F1 option, Again, there's the three kernels. I'm just going to accept the default uh, Gen 2. Press Enter. And we'll just wait for this to boot. So the, the video will have to sync up. So yeah, I've got a graphical cursor there, so it looks like it's all working fine. There's uh, KDE cursor there. So this is a USB 3, but I think the port that the computer's got is only USB 2 anyway, so it will be a little bit sluggish still. Um, if you boot from the UEFI, you do get an extra option to load the um, whole USB into memory, which is quite useful because it means you can unplug the USB and you don't need to worry about you know, unplugging it too early or anything like that. It seems like with the BIOS boot, you don't get that option. So I've got to remember to leave the USB plugged in all the time. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. 
So here's the keyboard uh, menu or, or window that I've got. Uh, first time I booted Gen 2. And what I find for myself, you'd have to check to see what keyboard you've got. But generally I've got a standard um, Windows type keyboard with the super key with the Windows logo on it. Uh, so it's actually a 105 key PC. And if I apply that first of all, that sets the sort of um, structure of the keyboard. So that's a standard QWERTY keyboard with the home end, page up, page down, and the cursor key and the numerical keypad, keypad on the side. But the important bit I want to do is I want to set the layout. So there's no layout set at the moment, but as you can see, the default one is actually the US. So I want it to remove that layout click on add and select again this looks a little bit different when I've booted into the UEFI so I'm not sure why that is but anyway you can type in say English or you know whatever language you've got let's try UK yeah and the one I want is this one here the extended with the Windows key uh, there's a preview button that appears so if I click that I can double check that that preview looks the same as the keyboard I'm using. It does. The UK keyboards tend to have this inverted L keyboard for the return. Importantly, the hash buttons next to it, so is the apostrophe. I've got a pound on the British pound sign on the three button, double quotes on the two, dollar on the four, and so on. So that looks OK. So I'll just click OK there and apply. So that should mean I've set up my keyboard. It's that simple. It's, it's quite quite easy to do. I'll get rid of that preview. Get rid of that window. And I'll start a browser off. And while that's loading, I'll also start a console off here as well. So what I'll do first of all is just organize these windows so that they're easy to use for the compiling we're going to do. So it's good to spend a little time setting your layout how you want it. I'm just going to roughly set this so that I've got the browser on the left where I'll be copying uh, commands from and the terminal on the right where I'll be pasting them into. So it's a logical left to right process. I'll just make this font a little bit bigger. Uh, one thing, one good tip I can give you is to try and ensure, in fact it's almost compulsory really, especially later on, to ensure that the width of the window you've got of your console is at least 80 characters wide. And the reason is when we come to build the kernel, when we go into the menuing system, it refuses to run unless the terminal has got at least 80 characters across. So you can see I've put these two windows roughly half and half on the screen, but the importantly, the console has got at least 80 characters. You can see the size when I resize here. It's just over 80 characters, it's 85 characters. So it doesn't matter you know, if it's not exactly 80, but as long as it's um, 80 characters or more, we won't have any problems later on. So the next thing I'm going to do is to make some changes to the system. Um, I can't remember if the default, I've, I better check actually, because uh, it will interrupt the recording. If I go to power, I think it is. I'm going to turn off the screen saver, otherwise you'll just get a black screen after 10 minutes when things are compiling. Um, so that turns off the screen. I don't think there's anything else to change here. Let's look at the display options. You may want to change these. You may not. I don't know. Display configuration. Let's just check to see if there's anything there or not. Oh, yeah. I didn't apply that change. So I'll apply that now. No, there's nothing there about powering down or anything so that's all I need to do so hopefully that will prevent the screen going blank 
Um, one other thing I'm going to do, I, I can't remember if there is a problem with this or not, but I'm going to do this anyway, is sometimes if the system does go into like, oh yes, it's a lock. It's the lock, that's what I want to do. If the screen does get automatically locked, you try to get in, um, you don't know what the passwords are for the root or the Gen 2 user that you get by default. So you can see the username Gen 2 and that's the host name Live CD. So what I need to do, yes, yeah, screen locking. Lock screen. Okay, so there's no automatic lock after five minutes. And it locks after waking from a sleep. So it's unlikely to be put to sleep unless I do that manually. So, but what I will do, just to be doubly sure, is I'm going to change the passwords. Uh, now, because I'm going to use simple passwords, it won't actually let me use simple passwords by default. So if I type in something simple, oh, well, in fact, it wants to know the password for the current uh, live CD Gen 2 user. Um, I could probably find it by searching uh, the Gen 2 website. There's probably somewhere it mentions it. If it doesn't, well, then we don't know what it is. Um, if I become root, I don't know what the password is for root. Uh, something we probably will need to know. But again, just in case. We don't know if we need to know it or not, but just in case. Um, if I set a new password to something simple, it tells me that it's too short to try again. If I try it again, it sends the same message. If I try it for a third time, it won't let me actually change it. So what we need to do is to alter a security file this in this etc security password quality control or quality check and if we change this setting here the enforce setting to press i for insert set it to none save that with escape code on x now if i set the password for the root you can see it's still warm me, but it is letting me change it. So I've now updated the password to something simple that I can remember. Um, it's only a temporary because remember we're in a live boot here. It's nothing that's being booted off the disk or anything. It's the live USB. Any changes we make here will be lost as soon as we power off. So I'll also change the Gen 2 user while I'm here. So we can use that with password Gen 2. And again, I'll send it to uh, set it to something simple. And again, it's allowed me to change that. So that's all done. And that would be in case the screen did get locked. It would ask for the Gen 2 password because that's the user we're logged in. So that's the reason why I've done that.